Albert Startup. I served in the United States Navy from July 1941 till the war's end, October 1945. I began my Navy service as an apprentice seaman in 1941 and left as an electrician's mate first class in the submarine service at the termination of World War II in 1945. I later joined the United States Army in 1947 and served until my retirement in 1963. This video is a brief accountment of my life in the United States Submarine Service. I was fortunate enough to survive the war while in the submarine service. May God bless the unfortunate sailors who did not make it home. Hello, this is Alex, a.k.a. Walla Alex, with a special uh, set of pictures and audio for you. I've got an interview with my grandpa's good friend Al Startup. He is a World War II submariner that served in the European and Pacific theaters. Uh, throughout this uh, slideshow and audio, you'll hear stories of his, and he answers some of our questions. It was just kind of impromptu and a quick visit. And uh, also integrated here are some pictures that he shared with us. So enjoy. And then there was Welch, who he and I made it into submarine school. I didn't even want to go to submarine school, but I went because they volunteered for it. So, so this was about 1941 you joined up, or when did you? Yeah, 41, before the war. Before the <laughs> war, you joined, and you specifically chose you know, the submarine. Pardon? You chose the submarine. Yeah. That's where I spent all my happy days. <laughs> How'd you decide on the submarines? Just something different? Well, no. I'm getting to that. I mean, they wanted to go, so all three of us volunteered. And the two people who wanted, one guy made it. And the submarine sank, the barb, during the war. And the other one couldn't make past the physical, so he went on destroyers. And I think he died during the war. I don't know. And uh, obviously I didn't. <laughs> but we made I made the North African invasion on the submarine. We uh, were off the coast of North Africa, and we did all the uh, photographic work there with, through the periscope, took pictures, surfaced uh, late night after we got all done with the pictures and gave the film to a destroyer, and the destroyer used that, took that information, and however they conveyed it to the invasion forces i don't know but at any rate they got the information and so what, what was your like mos like uh i was an electrician okay on submarines yeah and when i i put 10 years in the uh, submarines or in the navy of course submarine mm -hmm. service and then after the war i got tired of seeing nothing uh so i joined the army and spent 10 years in the army what kind of sub were you on what kind of a or were you on multiple different types or just like one the whole duration or well very... they were all the same type they all had 10 same torpedo class. tubes and uh, I guess other than that I don't know we, we did a lot of we took pictures do you know the name of it the one the main one or yeah the one that I was on the first one was the USS Shad Shad and the one that I put in commission uh, another one that was made in Manitowoc Wisconsin I rode that down to Mississippi and through the Panama Canal and we spent the time out in the uh, South Pacific. And that was the ice fish. Okay. The ice fish and the shad. Yeah. Let's see. Here's a... Uh, it says I'm entitled to wear the submarine combat and <laughs> They don't need to see the Well, why not? What the hell else they got to do? Listen to me talk or look at pictures? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Are these pictures of the subs? Like Those the are the submarines. Uh, I know that picture was in Australia, down at Perth, Australia. That's where we went for the. Uh, you'd be out. The patrol runs generally run between, depending on what you did. But they were generally between 45 days and 60 days. And you'd go back in for refueling and any minor repair that had to be made. So you were in North Africa, then where did you end up? Perth, Australia, we operated out of, I made, we 
over there and made the, uh, well, I was over there when the war ended, mm -hmm. and we ran all our patrol runs out of there, sinking all the Japs that we could, you know, that kind of stuff, and uh, made some invasions and things like that. So you were in some of those big battles, like in the Coral Sea? And... Oh, sure. Yeah. That's one thing about a submarine, and that's one thing I always liked about a submarine. I mean, you come back, you come back in one piece. It's like yes I mean, or no. I wouldn't be minus a leg or minus this or minus that. I did lose a little brain power, but <laughs> <laughs> you know that what that that's all it was. And it, it was uh, submarines have a tendency to teach you unification and cooperation. Mm -hmm. You either one guy can make a mistake on that boat and kill everybody. Mm -hmm. So everybody had to be. Uh, before you gave him any uh, job that was uh, influential, uh, let's say, in the outcome, mm -hmm. you had to be qualified submarine man, and you had to know how to rig every compartment on that boat for fire, depth mm -hmm. charge, surface, and dive. And that was before you could become a qualified submariner. Yeah. So you experienced depth charges at times. Oh, <laughs> you bet. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they make your head rock. I mean, uh, I came close to I came uh, as close to being killed as I guess you could be without being killed. But one time we were being depth charged. You know, and these, these depth <laughs> charges are they look like in fact they call them ash cans. Mm -hmm. They're about uh, look to be I'm guessing about that round, about mm -hmm. eighteen to two foot, and they set the depth on it. It's a uh, depth detonated, and they roll them off the back of destroyers and, and ships like this mm -hmm. when they know there's a submarine down there and they're in the proximity. Mm -hmm. And one thing about it you learn is if they're far enough away that you hear it click and then boom, they aren't going to get you because the sounds are two different frequencies and consequently the click of being the higher sound travels quicker. And uh, if you can hear that, you know they're going to miss you. Mm -hmm. But at one time we were submerged in uh, battle stations and all of our fuel tanks are open at the top. I mean, so as the fuel is used, seawater comes in so you maintain the right buoyancy. Mm -hmm. Well, we were being uh, depth charged and it blew the top off of the valve. See, the valves all have, you know, you got the handle to operate the valve and then you the top part screws down on the uh, main valve mm -hmm. and it blew the top right off of one of the valves, came across the compartment and missed me about, yeah, I'm going to say a foot. And uh, it went boom, just like that. And I said, thank you, Lord. That was yeah. the and if, then, you, yeah. if you turn around and sink a ship or whether you yeah. sunk them or not, I mean, if they picked you up on a, some you. kind of a sonar yeah. or a radar <laughs> or something, why, you were going to catch it by somebody. Yeah, especially after you shot it up. You yes. Uh, if a surface ship wanted to depth charge it, you had to, they'd rig for silent running is what they called it. And it was silent because any sound transmits like mad underwater. You can hear it all over. I don't know, like in the movies, they're like, whenever they're getting depth charged, they're like, nobody's even whispering. That's you know? true. That's yeah. true. That's one reason they never f f they never feed beans on a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many ships did you sink? Oh Lord, I don't remember. It was it, they didn't figure it that way. To be honest with you, Hirsch, it was in uh, tonnage. Ton tonnage, yeah. No, no. We got our right. share in that so, you know, mm -hmm. In fact, I the on the back. we made the invasions. Uh, a couple of invasions, and what we would do is to just come up to the surface with the periscope, and there was a camera that fit on the periscope, and you'd take all the pictures of the coast and the defense areas that they had, and then we'd surface at night after you got them and give them to the surface ship, where they would turn around and utilize them. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to go to all those invasions, like Guadalcanal and... Yeah. We made we made quite a few of them. But I mean, uh -huh. just for reconnoitering for information. Uh -huh. Did you sink ships up there while you were there? Pardon? Did you sink any ships? Oh, heck yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we we got out and 
sunk ship. That was part of our job. Yeah. <laughs> we got debt charged quite a few times. And I remember that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> that must have been something. Well, they paid extra for it. I thought that was good. And not being able to see, like, you're just, it's all. Yeah, if you, if you have a tendency, even a remote chance of having claustrophobia, forget it. The submarines just, there wasn't that much room to move around. How many of you were in a crew? Uh, 62, something like that. That The newspaper clipping for the Bullhead, did you know that crew? I mean, did you know that? I probably knew some of the people. They were just out of the same port, but basically? I mean, this, to be able to recall uh, names, no. But, you know, when you You knew of them, for sure. Yeah, yeah. when yeah. we were in submarine school, we didn't all go through at the same time. But there was a lot of submarine classes going on. And the boats that they put in commission, the new boats and stuff like that, and the old boats, they did all the training on them there at New London, or there was a place out in California that they trained some of them. That just depends. Were you ever in a position where they had you looking at the scope when you were looking at enemies, or was it always? No, no. And the only people that looked into the scope were, uh, was the officers. Okay. And uh, you could look through the scope if we weren't in a yeah, battle just, station or something like that. But if you were making a run on a boat... Well, everyone had a specific spot where they were like oh, locked Oh yeah, battle in. station submerged and battle station surface. And, uh, or surface. But at any rate, you had a place to be. Like uh, battle station submerged. Or one time, I say one time, one phase of my career, I was the roving electrician. Anything that went wrong, I had to fix it as soon as possible. So you're just sitting there ready to rock? like whenever. No, I was walking all over oh. the boat. <laughs> and, uh, then if you get into a maneuvering position, then I was the uh, junior controllerman. Or after a while I got promoted, I became the senior controllerman. I mean, you know, it's just various jobs yeah. in your department. Yep. That was about it. How deep would those run? Like the deepest you guys would go? Uh, well, periscope depth was something like, you know, I'm... Roughly, yeah. I'm going to say between... Well, I had between 40-some-odd feet and maybe uh, 60 feet. So they, the periscopes were pretty they figure long. From, yeah. Go ahead. They figure from the bottom of the... That your feet are figured, you know, from the bottom of the ship's hull okay. to the top of the scope. That then yep. you, there was a lot of waves, big waves and stuff like that. Forget it, you know. And the waves would come 10, 15 feet high. It was hard to see anything, but you'd never fire a torpedo under those conditions anyway. Yeah, those were the days. Were the torpedoes different than the ones they were dropped? Like the oh yeah, the torpedo because I know the ones that they had at the beginning of the war. Were very well, poor. The ones they had at the beginning of the war were what we called steam fish. They had a wake because uh, they would have an exhaust and that would lead to the wake. After the war started and probably halfway through, we had electrical torpedoes with batteries in them, and that was another one of my jobs to keep the batteries charged in the torpedoes. And obviously, they didn't leave a wake. The torpedo was about, I'm thinking now, I don't remember. Uh, the older ones were 16 inches in diameter, and the bigger ones were 21 inches in diameter. Okay. Like, what was your range, roughly, like when you'd go out for 30 to 60 days or whatever it was? Like, how far away would you go from your base location? As far as they told us to go, hundreds, so you, hundreds, So you had quite a big range. Miles. Yeah. Depends on what was going on. Yeah. The the main submarine bases, like when we were in the Atlantic, our submarine base was up in uh, Rosny, Scotland. That was up uh, close to Loch Lomond uh, in that area. And over in the Pacific, there were numerous areas there. Uh, Pearl Harbor, obviously, uh, and uh, Australia. And then they had refueling ships that were moving around that you could... So were you in both theaters during World War II? Oh, yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, I got to enjoy all the fun. <laughs> I was uh, I was in the service before the war started. Yeah. And so you were an old salt then compared to some of the other <laughs> ones. Too old at that time. Well, I, I know like 17. a twenty-five-year-old was like old. Well, that's know? when I joined. The day yeah. I was yeah. seventeen, I wanted to leave that 
home over there in Pontiac and depart and see what was going on in the world, and I did. So this is the launching of a sub here. Is yes. that the, is that the ice fish? That's the way they launched it. Is that the ice fish, or is that... I frankly don't okay. remember. I'd be a liar to tell you which one it was. Because you have the actual photo of that one later here. That one. Generally, if I kept the photo that big, it was, you know, I had been there or was something. There's some pictures there with a lot of people yeah, in Perth, see. Australia, that when they uh, said the war was over. So then you were in from where, 41 to 50, like, like you were up until Korea, during Korea, you switched to the army. Is that how that worked, or? Uh, I got out of the service after the war, okay. uh, and then uh, before the Korean War started, why I got tired of just living in a can all the time. So I said, "To heck with! I want to join the army so I can see what's going on in the world." And join the army, and got I was a, a radar repair. Um, and in the army, and then I took, I got the warrant officer's rating and became a warrant officer. Then I finished my 20 like that. And when that was over, I was out. I'd had well, enough. Well, you did missiles for a while. Yeah, oh, well, I taught guided missiles. I, uh, when we were down in uh, Alabama, Alabama. Why, I was a guided missile instructor, electronics, I taught, you know, that kind of thing. Now you had to come up on those subs then, you had to come up pretty frequently to, to the air. Didn't Every you? night. Every night? But not during the daytime. Uh, yeah. But, don't ever let anybody tell you the fresh air doesn't have a sweet smell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're submerged with a few other people for the day, and that's one reason that, like I say, beans was never in the formula for me. <laughs> it uh, could get a little hectic. Yeah. So I'm sure, do you ever times where you had to stay down longer than you wanted to? Or? Sure, if there was a certain enemy out there with depth charges, you stayed down as long as you could to stay alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. They have, they had, uh, I'm trying to think of the container, I think it was cans, CO2 absorbent. Uh, if they were down for any length of time and couldn't get fresh air, they, they used the CO2 absorbent. They'd open it up and spread it out on the deck or on the mattresses, a piece of leather or something like that. But you joined up when you were 17. Oh, I got to pick what I wanted. Okay, so you chose electrician. Like, okay. And then in the Army, well, I was guided missile electrician. Talking why elect missile why electrician? Just interesting to you? I mean, Pardon? when you were 17, like electrician, why, why did you choose that then? Why did I choose it? I mean, were you, you had an interest in it before? I mean, well, yeah, because I lived out in the country and we had kerosene <laughs> lights and the radio, for God's sakes, was radio out of the car on a battery. You're like, give me all the power. I want it all. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I got pretty good at trimming the wicks and kerosene lights. You know, this kind of stuff. Did you ever get any special missions where you had to deploy special people on the islands? Or... Oh, sure. Yeah. He would, Jim, we'd put, we'd, we, uh, in North Africa, we took all of the, not all of them, there were a couple other submarines, but we took the uh, invasion beaches, photographed them all, surfaced at night and gave them to the ships, the development, decide what, where they were going, when and how, and this kind of stuff. Yeah, and then uh, we took pictures of uh, Iwo Jima, stuff like this, before they in, invaded that. We'd surface at night in the day, and sometimes in the daytime, you'd take pictures if there weren't any surface ships around mm -hmm. because the periscope going through the water leaves a little wake, you know, and you didn't want to indicate. They knew we were in the area for yeah. God's sakes, but mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't know where. Did you have to deal with like spotter planes much? I mean, Oh, sure. There was always those flying around at night, but then we had uh, the radar that would pick them up and we generally just go down beneath the surface a little bit. Just we enough, wouldn't make right? a deep dive. So you picked up pilots? Uh, oh, sure. They'd make a run for when they were bombing Japan or some of those places. They'd ditch their planes or get shot down, and uh, we'd pick them up if they were still alive or pick them up dead. We've had people, we'd pick them up and they'd die aboard a submarine. Yeah. You pick up after ships have been sunk and pick up people too? And uh, like big Yeah, rest? yeah. Yeah. Well, I only, I was trying to think as I was talking there, and I, I only remember them burying maybe two people 
that we picked up that were pilots mm -hmm. and they were shot down and you'd pick them up and we had two of them that died aboard the submarine and we buried them at sea, put them in a canvas bag with weights in it. Mm -hmm. and at night, they'd go over the side, you know. Hell of a way to go, but that's life. Yes, yeah, so you spent time in Australia. Pardon? We, where were you in Australia? Perth. How long would you Fremantle is the place, and then we'd go into Perth. Yeah. How long would you be in dock there? Like a week once you've been Depends. out there? It would generally be uh, oh, 15 days max. And the, the whole crew, obviously, was divided into half, uh, port and starboard watch. So they'd turn around, and half of the crew would go ashore on leave. The other half would stay aboard and work on the ship and things that needed fixed. Plus, uh, every place that you tied up for something like that, there were shore people there too that helped you. Yeah. you know, but you were there because you knew the boat and they could help them uh, do various jobs to get back Labor. in shape. Yeah. So you could go out and get depth charged again. <laughs> was that, I mean, was that that common where you got depth charged? Like pretty? Well, if you got into combat and uh, you, they would drop, if they saw anything on the radar, they would just... Well, on whose part? I mean, ours or theirs? Theirs. I mean, like, I mean, I guess... Well, they knew what they knew when their own boats, when their own submarines would be in uh, the area. Yeah. You know what I mean. So if they weren't, then... Well, yeah, anything they sent down you there then, <laughs> from whales down to minnows, they sunk or tried to. <laughs> hmm. There must have been something else to do. How, how deep did you go? Uh, we'd get down, the average depth that we would operate at would be periscope depth, which was probably, I'm trying to remember now, based on the submarine uh, uh, periscopes, and probably 50 to 70 feet, something like that, and uh, that's just the tip of the periscope. Yeah. The boat would be deeper than that, but I mean about 60 or 70 Was feet. there like a depth charge depth? I mean. Pardon? Was there, how deep would you go when you were getting depth charged? Just well, as deep as you had to. Uh, probably the average depth would be, I'm going to say 200 feet, something like that. Could deep. they go much deeper? Oh, yeah. I've been down to 600 feet someplace oh, yeah. in there, yeah. When the, when the submarine's first put in commission, they make what they call a deep dive to check, make sure all of the... Uh, valves and anything that goes through the hull is functioning the way it should be so that you don't leak water by it or something mm -hmm. like that we ate well though i'll say that yeah they had the best food going of submarines they didn't, we didn't have anything fresh but i mean you know they had uh, good meals i thought now were you generally like just was your submarine just solo out there or were you generally in roughly groups of However many, or was it just solo missions? You generally, every... you generally uh, in fact, you were always, before you left port, you were assigned an area to patrol or to take care of. And obviously, if you were in a submarine pack, uh, if there was uh, more submarines, right, the area that you were in was smaller. If you were making an invasion, why, yeah. you had various areas to For cover sure. and take pictures of. Before would you... they have like a pair of them patrolling a certain area, or is it? Or they kind of overlap a little, like uh, not too much because you, you weren't. I don't think you wanted the, coverage. The ID <laughs> wasn't that well. I mean, as far as knowing who was in, if there was somebody uh, in your area, okay. you didn't want to say, "Geez, I wonder if they're an enemy." Or you wanted a, to be no doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes Most sense. Most of the stuff, obviously, that we had to deal with, it was was uh, surface stuff. Obviously, I remember we came back uh, by. I'm trying to think when we were coming back into England and Scotland in the North African area and in France there was a St. Laurent area there that was a, a German submarine base and we that was always pretty hairy trying to get by those because you, you had to identify another boat and make sure and you didn't want to make a mistake. Yeah. They'd try to know where you were but I mean you could always... Did you, did you have contact with... Uh home base or at least the sub pack leader or something oh yeah like it, uh, it was all on a receiving basis because I mean we didn't we weren't didn't want to 
transmit because you can be picked up by the enemy too easy. But you you could get the report every night. You'd come up and they'd have a general report. Okay. The various things that had gone off during if the day. If something changed or something. Yeah. yeah. So how many were on a crew? Uh, depends on the size of the boat, but uh, generally the fleet type submarines were, like I said before, 311 feet, three quarter inches long, and they had a port watch and a starboard watch, so you had to have twice as many people aboard to operate, and then you, the officers had maybe seven or eight officers, or less, depends, you know. But uh, you say how many was in the crew depends on the size of the sub. The ORNS boats would probably get by with 40 people. We had maybe 60 to 80 on one watch, so I'd say probably around 100. How, what were your quarters like for you? What, just like a hammock? Uh, no, there was a steel frame bed that came, that was hinged. On the, I'm talking the ones on the bulkheads now. The porter starboard would come down like this and there'd be a chain. And oh. they were three high. And there was a row of those on the port side, a row of those on the starboard side. And in the center were uh, bunks that were maybe two across, three across, something like that. And did you have like shifts? As far, I mean, like, was everyone up during the day and some up at night, or was it like no, some no. would be day, like half up a day? Submarines half up a day. never went up in the daytime. I mean, at like at night, um, or I'm talking sleeping. So at night, was there like a skeleton crew, like awake? Most no. people, it, you were either the port and starboard watch, and you the way it worked out. Always when you were out was four on and eight off. And the four on, I would be on the controllers. Eight off, I could sleep, or the other eight off, I had to do maintenance work. Okay. And that went on for, like I say, around 60 days. Some as short as 40 something. So uh, which one is you in these pictures? Are you the one the hard time? Well, you, well, come on over and I'll show you. Are you the one that looks like he's 12? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the one that was scared. <laughs> The one of them in the does in the caption says, "I'm not right there." Okay, that's you. What yeah, about, that's me. How about this? Let me see. I'm not sure you're in that. I'm one. not in this picture. Yeah. Not Have, did you show them the one with the movie star? I can't remember who it was now. Yeah. Who was it? I don't know, honey. Well, you got no. That guy there. Who is that? That's him right there. Oh, I know that, but this guy. I don't know. Yeah, there was a movie star there. He was a pretty famous guy. Which one? Uh, this one? Yeah, this okay. guy, Spencer Tracy. Yeah. Spencer Tracy. Oh, yeah. oh it's Spencer wow. Tracy right there. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't in the crew. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> but what was Spencer Tracy doing there? In ordaining. Well, that's their idea. You don't have to fight a war, just sure that them bastards got that guy. USO. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Can he pick himself out in that one? That's Are you in this That's one? Him. This guy right here. Oh, Lord, now he made me put my glasses on. Yeah, yeah I'm in this one, but I don't know where. Where? Let's see. Oh, there I am right there. He spotted me. How many in? Yeah, let's see. Right there, uh, let's see, uh, sitting right next to the uh, people, the officers. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm the seventh one in. Right next to that little gap. Gotcha. Where does it sit here? Huh. How about that? You were priv privileged, right? You got to sit next to the officers. <laughs> well, I was kissing the ass. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pardon my friend. So what's some of your most memorable experiences? Uh, I was trying to think of we, Probably the most exciting one was when we were... Uh, off in Japan uh, just before they, the war was over and we had to take uh, reconnaissance pictures of the various areas. Like of Japan? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, that, that was, you know, sort of sneaky. I mean, you, you didn't want to even have anybody know you were there, but of course they knew you were there. 
But you didn't want them to know where. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, that was bad if they knew where. You know, <laughs> had a long way to go getting out of there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Probably the best ride I ever had on a submarine was down the Mississippi. Last submarine I was on, the USS Icefish, was built in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. We did our running, our as well as you could, of course, in fresh water because the buoyancy is different between salt and fresh water, but it was in Lake Michigan. And then we got on a dry dock, and you have more buoyancy. I guess the story I want to tell you is the most buoyancy you have is in salt water. Fresh water, you sink deeper. So when you go down the Mississippi with the varying depths of fresh water, you have to be on a floating dry dock. So I went all the way down <laughs> from uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, uh, on a floating dry dock down to New Orleans and huh. out. And then uh, maneuvering, I guess. Yeah, that'd be pretty an interest. I guess they saw it a lot then. Maybe I was gonna say it'd be an interesting sight to see a sub going down the. Well, it was on a floating dry dock, and the war was on, so yeah. they expected crap <laughs> like that, you know, up and down. The and then you get down, you'd get down into. Uh, we were going into the South Pacific, but of course you'd go down there in. Put you in fresh water, and you had to turn around and figure your buoyancy and everything all over again and perfect things. And you know, and then you'd go down, go through the Panama Canal. I've been through that about five times in various things. That was quite a haul to get over to the Pacific, then, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, so. sure was. Go through the Panama Canal, and you'd go on out, and you'd uh, end up probably out uh, maybe Pearl Harbor, and then you'd refuel, get torpedoes and this kind of stuff and supplies and head out. And then the next time after you got out of your patrol, and now you'd pull into the various islands that were ours, but the, the ones you liked going to the best was Australia. Did they send you right back when the war was over? Pardon? Did they send you right back to the U.S. when the war was over? Or did you have to hang around over there? Nah, when the war was over, we left Australia as quick as we could get out. In the in the sub or just they flew out or? No, I rode back on a tender, but some of them rode back on a sub. I mean, they rotated their certain percentage of the crew. It was just built into the law that so many of the crew were transferred every time they'd take new people aboard. I mean, I guess they didn't want you to burn out when you're out in combat on a sub, you know. So they rotated you. Okay. Yeah, I rode a tender back. Then I operated out of the Aleutian Islands for a while. Uh, hmm. Taught himself out. <laughs> Did the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Never a dull moment. When you were in the subs, could you, like, were they he uh, heated, I'm assuming? Some sort were they of what? Heated? I mean, climate controlled at all? I mean, <laughs> you don't have to really worry about heat in a submarine. <laughs> it's the odor of your fellow shipmates. <laughs> but, like, you know, if you were in the Atlantic, the Atl Atlantic versus Pacific, could you feel that it was warmer? Colder water? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I, not too bad. But you see, when you're when you're submerged in a combat cold. zone, you're not running the air conditioner and stuff like this. So it's warm. It's going to be hot. You bet. Now you can tell when you're in hot water or cold water. Real cold. I mean, not, not a few degrees temperature, but you can sure tell if there was a big change. That's for sure. So when you were running at night on the surface, if there was a storm, it was a pretty rough ride. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you had to get in the batteries charged regardless. So in a sub, that must have been really rough. Just hold on. <laughs> well, yeah, I've seen stuff like that. I've seen storms like that at night, and you had, you don't just walk like this. You hold on to stuff as you go, or you're going to tip over. I do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> yeah, I thought she'd been on submarines. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You don't do that. Not too bad, anyway. Yeah, although that was a good life, really and truly. I enjoyed it. I mean, other than being depth charged and trying to be somebody trying to kill you. Other than that, why, it wasn't bad. Life. Everyone was just doing their job. They were too, right? You're doing your That's job, right. they're doing theirs. Yeah. You, you all ever uh, put some torpedoes into a Japanese carrier? You remember? A bigger oh, ship? We've tried, yeah, we, I don't remember specifically, but yeah, we've had successful runs and sunk ships, but I don't remember. I didn't know anybody aboard the ship, and I don't know the name of it. My my job during Battle Station Submerged was on the controls. I mean, yeah, yeah. what the hell? 
how quick from when Pearl Harbor happened, like, how quick were you, like, de- I mean, were you already deployed before then? No. Pearl Harbor, where was I when Pearl Harbor broke out? Let's see. Well, I don't know. I was out of submarine school, but, I mean, I don't know. Uh, how fast after that were you in the action? I mean, like, did they have you going places, I guess? I don't know. A couple months. I mean, I, I had, okay, now I remember, I put two submarines in commission. The one submarine I put in commission, the first one was the Shad, and that was out of uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I remember hearing about the, you know, the board, Pearl Harbor, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then probably it was a matter of weeks and we were sent over to Europe and England and like I said, the Rosny, Scotland area and operating out of that area. Okay. And I made some, I don't know, three or four patrol runs out of there. Each patrol run was probably the average of 50 to 60, 65 days. Then after that, uh, I was sent back to the States. They, they generally rotate the people, you know, if they can. And I got to leave, I went home and then uh, picked up a new submarine in uh, Wisconsin and finished, they finished building that thing and we gave it all of its sea trials out in Lake Michigan and that kind of stuff. And then from there, we went down, like I say, down the Mississippi and through the Panama Canal and down to Pearl Harbor, out of Pearl Harbor, down to uh, into Australia. Had you been to Pearl Harbor before then? Once. Yeah. Like before the December 7th or after? Oh, no, afterwards. Yeah. Did you know where it was? I mean, like when it happened? It was you? out in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know exactly. Well, I, everybody in the service knew December the 7th. I mean, but like before then, like you, they said Pearl Harbor, you know, did no, you? No, I knew where it was, okay. yeah. The Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. <laughs> it was a base. Yeah. yeah. So what did it look like when you got there? Had they got it all cleaned up yet? Or just oh, no. The Arizona is still sunk and stuff like that. There was debris all over the place when we got there. Mm-hmm. The air, then there was, what was the name of that field? Hickam Field mm-hmm. or I think it was down there. That was pretty well beat up, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those were the days. Or did you ever go into like a, where they had a big battle and like through the area where they recently had a big Yeah, we were in some of them. I mean, uh, yeah. there was, uh, we chased the, uh, Another submarine all around the northern part of England and Scotland trying to find it, never did. And like I say, made the North African invasion and uh, made the Iwo Jima uh, invasion, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Generally, our, our action in the invasions was to reconnoiter yeah. that kind of stuff. And we picked up a like a pilot would be yeah. down, shot down someplace, we'd pick them up, you know, this guy, if we were lucky enough to find them. But never like a ship. lucky enough to be found. Like a ship that was sunk, an American ship. Did you ever have to go in and find those people? Or, I mean... Uh, there was... Because uh, they, they probably had those PBYs, the Catalinas, the big planes, do that oh, more. Oh, yeah, but it depends know. on what area you're in. True. I was thinking, coming back from Europe uh, one time, coming back from England, beginning of the war there was a ship sunk up in that area with a lot of people on it and we we got some of the people okay pretty sure did you have to go up on top and help them in or yeah they weren't swimming down to us (laughs) i mean like you personally (laughs) that's for sure yeah we dumped some off i was trying to remember as i was talking with us Pick like, every now and then you'd pick up a, an aerial crew or something. Was, I think was it plane that went down. We put them ashore in some area in northern Canada. I was trying, I coming down, trying to think of the name of the town or the name of the port, but I can't remember. It. But we'd pick up four or five people and put them down. Did they give you any training like of a stud? Got stuck on the bottom. Didn't they have a way to recover or open up? To... Well, I know they had those, like, you could, there was, like, a room that would pressurize and fill with water, and you'd maybe have a bag you had on yourself or that would inflate and it would pull you up to the top. Uh, 
there was like in the ships I know I'd read that they had maybe that was a later model I don't know but one of the ships like to- totally was disabled and they had to like they, they didn't lose power because they still had lights but they had to go to this section of the sub that they would you know lock the door then it would fill with water and then they'd grab this inflate this bag would inflate and they'd shoot them up to the top the bag the monster and long yeah there were some ships like that that went down or some subs and not very many because uh, the stuff in the South Pacific and uh, out in the middle of the Atlantic and stuff like that it was too deep. You yeah. couldn't come up with it. It was a, a unique circumstance. Feet, yeah. it was, if it's deeper than that, you might as well give it up. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Plus the fact, once you got to the top, what the hell do you get to do? <laughs> Stay around and drown? <laughs> I mean, you know. That's about it. There's no way you were lucky enough to get picked up. Well, at least in the Pacific, maybe maybe near an island, and maybe the natives wouldn't eat you. I don't know. No, it depends. I mean, it, there's some spots in the Pacific that are too deep to come up, some in the Atlantic, and you know what I mean. But did they, all have the, did they all have the capability to do that? I mean, like, Pardon? did they all have, did you get the training on how to do that? Or... The only thing you did in submarine training was uh, they taught you how to use the Monson Lung. That's what it was. It was mandatory yeah. that uh, you make, uh, for example, they'd take you out in the day and uh, if you notice New London, Connecticut or some of the places and they have it, it looks like a tall silo uh, it and it's there. over a hundred feet tall. Well, during the, in the center of that thing is a rope or a line and you go down, they teach you how to use this monster lung, and you go down 12 feet. Then you go down, the next one is 25 feet. You make an escape from 25 feet to the surface. Then you go down to 50 feet, and you make an, you make an escape from there. And then from then on, it's voluntary. But you're saying like 95 times out of 100, you wouldn't have that option. No, yeah. that's true. That's true. <laughs> but you knew if you did, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, uh, you can. Uh, I, I made the uh, ascent from a hundred feet, but you have this. This line goes up the center, and they they've got uh, markers on it every so often. And you go up the line, and you stop, and you take so many breaths through the lung at that time to sort of equalize the pressure, and then you go up another. 15 or 20 feet and you stop again that kind of thing but what the hell out in the middle of the ocean what the hell's the difference you come up and you see nothing but water there's nothing to hold on to fresh air has a sweet smell yeah. <laughs> that's probably definitely a unique perspective that not many people get it's like the tr- the, the true smell of fresh air it, you know? it is nice and you get to enjoy it they try to rotate the people every so often, you know. But, so uh, I made all of the uh, patrol runs of North African invasion and all that stuff over in uh, the Atlantic. And then uh, I got transferred. Uh, it was my turn to get transferred. And uh, they transferred me back to the uh, United States on the surface tender. And then I, I went on a 30-day leave. And then they I was assigned to a submarine being built in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. So while you're there, you go to the classes uh, that there's, and you learn the boat that you're being, you know, placed on. Then uh, they allowed everybody to have a 30-day leave just before the boat went down to Mississippi. But I went down to Mississippi on it, so I didn't get the 30-day leave. I wasn't married. They tried to pick the guys, you know, that were didn't have could have something to do. Yeah. And I rode that thing down, and then you got into the uh, area down there at the base of the Mississippi, and you went to training. You see, when you're operating out in fresh water, the buoyancy is different, so everything changes on the boat. You have to times that the tanks are pumped and this kind of stuff to keep it, you know, to keep the equilibrium, equilibrium up or buoyancy in the proper area. And then you went through the Panama Canal and you went down to Pearl Harbor. And then you'd get down there and you'd make some more runs. And when I say runs, I mean, you'd, you'd go out in the daytime and get this sub uh, all buoyancy, all your yeah, always stuff something fixed up, you know, get it ready for that area, salt water, water temperature. And then they'd load up the live torpedoes and you're off and running. Did you always have the beat, like, even when you were 
going to your patrol area, did you always have something to do? I mean, you were always doing four something. on and eight off. I mean, you All were you were always time. going. Like, I was on if depending on what job you had, of course, but you always had something to do. Like uh, when I was first uh, out there, and I was uh, just a greenhorn, so to speak. Why I got to water the batteries and take care of them uh, and do electrical maintenance work, that kind of stuff. And then this was on the uh, 16 hours that you were off. The other job, you, they'd always assign you uh, a battle station surface position and a battle station submerged. Uh, and then it would be normal running submerged and this kind of stuff. Uh, one time, uh, I say one time for maybe one patrol run, I'd be on the uh, water manifold, which you pump water from one tank to another to get the equilibrium. If you fire a torpedo, you lose so much weight, so you have to put, you know, compensate that to keep the boat level, this kind of stuff. Battle stations submerge is different, battle stations all the time. There's always something to do. You had to learn to, before you got your submarine pay, you had to learn to oh, read yeah. every compartment for fire, depth charge, no, no. surface, this kind of stuff. All the valves, which ones are open, which ones are closed. And so when they got you guys involved when you were building it, you knew it inside from one room to another. Well, you did, but you, you <laughs> sure couldn't remember every valve on the submarine. <laughs> you know what I mean, unless you utilized it. Hmm. And then when I was, when I was, before I had a lot of experience, Arians uh, electrically, why I'd operate the trim manifold, mm -hmm. which was all water. You'd open this valve, shut that valve, start the pumps, transfer the water around. Every time you fire a torpedo, the bow would come up and, or have a tendency to be more buoyant because of the loss of weight. So you had to shift water from aft to mm -hmm. forward to keep the submarine still on an even, uh, even keel. Great. Never a dull moment. Yeah. So that was like your battle station submerged. Was doing that, Some, uh, and sometimes. the difference between battle stations and submerged and battle stations uh, surface was obviously we had a deck gun and you had people on machine guns. I had that job for a while. Did they ever use those? In uh, no, I never did. Yeah. We never. My idea of uh, living is to keep a submarine submerged yeah. <laughs> because you're on the surface you don't stand a chance really and truly with any boat with a good deck crew on the guns way uh, uh -uh. we had uh on the first boat i was on they had a three inch deck gun and then the last boat i was on had a five inch deck gun made a bigger boom and uh I was 50, I had a 50 caliber machine gun post on that. That's not easy to fire a gun like that because it's, the boat's giving it this all the time. <laughs> You're trying to aim something at something and you better keep keep it with the waves. going up and down <laughs> like this or you were going to completely go over the hull. Did you have like target practice out there where they throw a buoy oh, out yeah, or something? Yeah. Did you ever hear what was the fate of your ships? Did they just scrap them out? Or well, uh, they can know I heard the fate of the first one I was on, the Shad, uh, after the war, they gave it to some European ally. I don't know who it was, Lower Bulgaria that, or something. I don't know. But whatever happened to the ice fish, I don't know. Then, yeah. I, like I say, after I got out, I had a, a ship's captain's license that uh, up to 50 ton that I could take people out on cruises and I had boats over here in Lake Michigan and this kind of stuff. Probably the, the most unpleasant thing we ever did on a submarine that I'm aware of uh, was one of the pilots we picked up died. So we got a big piece of canvas and sewed it up and put him over the side at night when we surfaced. It was weighted of course so it didn't float. But I didn't like that. But some of the uh, pilots, uh, or I call them pilots, they might not have been a pilot, he might have been part of the air crew, mm -hmm. but was talking to them, stuff like this, you know. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just hung out for the rest of your patrol then? I mean, Well, yeah. Uh, if we had somebody that was... A VIP or needed to get back. Or, well, that's true. Yeah. Then we would go back. We had picked up, uh, we had picked up some uh, 
pictures, or not pictures, but the people that took the pictures with their cameras of the areas they were going so to invade in North them. Africa and Southwest Pacific. But then you would surface, you'd meet a surface ship on the night and transfer, transfer them. I can remember during the war I, when I was putting the ice fishing commission over in Manitowoc or in that area, uh, anything to save money. <clears throat> so I was on leave and I didn't want to spend any money for hotel rooms or anything like that, you know, because it, it was, uh, you'd run short of your booze money. And <laughs> I went down to local jail and uh, they put, they give you a, a cell at night for nothing. Are well, you serious? I'm serious. And so when I went down to this jail, and sure, you can spend the night. But, I went down to this one little, what they had a cot in it, one little room, the wash basin and bars, you know. But when I got in the damn thing, clank, he shut the door and locked it. <laughs> and I said, well, what are you doing that for? You know, and he says, it's a state law that if there's anybody in the cell, it has to be locked. So I slept the night off and on <laughs> until I got up the next day. <laughs> but you, uh, look at the money I said. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't know my real. Did they give you breakfast when you left? I could have had it, but I didn't want it. I, <laughs> I, I just wanted freedom. These two pictures were taken of the USS Clyde, and that, this was after the war was over, and this was getting ready for our departure back to the United States. Everybody seems content. Is that the tender? Yes. This is uh, Perth, Australia pictures. I sat and got them after the war. These, I was on the boat. This was when we were getting shoving off, heading back to the States. Did you keep in touch with any of the crewmates at all? or Not anymore. I've been away too long because after the war, I joined the Army. Mm -hmm. After I, I went back and finished school. Mm -hmm. And then I joined the Army. And for the Korean War and all that, I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. Did you have any reunions or anything like that for the, the yeah. ice fish? Nope. Did you go to ice fish reunions? Not yeah. after I would we got out because they gave that submarine to another oh, country. Okay. Well, like, yeah, I guess, yeah. You, you went to one reunion in Wisconsin. Well, yeah. Well, I don't yeah, know they, what it was. I don't <laughs> that was the sh up where they built the submarine. Okay. I don't know. Well, for years you never talked about it at all. No, no. Well, it's it history now. Back. Now it comes back. Mm -hmm. I don't know. One thing I believe is fresh air has a sweet smell. <laughs> fresh air. <laughs> you'd surface at night and all of the body odor and all crap would go out in the hull and you'd get the fresh water or the fresh air that would come in. <laughs> what they did is diesels, as you probably know, take a hell of a lot of air to, for their combustion process. And uh, when they would turn around and come up at night, they'd get them started uh, on the air outside, and then they'd turn around and take a suction in the boat and clean it out. Just about make your eyes water sitting at the table eating. <laughs> I mean, not by the odor, but by the fresh air rushing by going out the <laughs> main induction pipe. Yeah. And that's the end of the little interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it and got a good insight into his specific experience in submarines in World War II. You guys have a good one.